Hello everyone, I'm James Harkins, host of This Week in Texas History, a weekly show that is part of the Save Texas History program. Save Texas History is brought to you by Commissioner George P. Bush and the Texas General Land Office. If you love our state's history and want to make sure that it lasts forever, please visit SaveTexasHistory.org and consider making a tax-deductible donation. Today, we have Dr. Andrew Torgett as our guest. Dr. Torgett is a 19th century historian who teaches at the University of North Texas, and his work involves the themes of the expansion of the American South into the West and developing new digital methods for research. His most recent book is Seeds of Empire, Cotton, Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands, 1800 to 1850, which tells the story of how global economic shifts during the first half of the 19th century transformed Northern Mexico into the American Southwest. He also holds the Guinness World Record for the world's longest history lesson, clocking in at 26 hours and 33 minutes. He's promised not to talk that long today. Today, Dr. Torgett will be discussing the Digital Austin Papers, which you can find at digitalaustinpapers.org. Hello, Dr. Torgett. Thank you for making the time to speak with us today. I'm glad to be here. Good to see you, James. You started as a graduate student at the University of Virginia, and you've been involved with several projects that marry history and uh, digital technology. How did you discover that you wanted to combine history with these new technologies? And can you discuss some of your earlier projects that you developed? Yeah, so, um, so I, I went to the University of Virginia, and um, when I went there, I had zero intention of doing anything digital whatsoever. I didn't know that existed. Like, I went to grad school um, in 2001, and um, I went there to study the American South and slavery, and UVA was a good place to do that. Um, what I didn't know is that UVA had the some of the earliest digital humanities centers in the country. Um, IBM showed up there in the early 1990s and basically handed over several computers for historians and uh, English professors to just see what they could do with. So when I got there, there were people experimenting with that kind of stuff. Um, one of whom was my advisor, a guy named uh, Ed Ayers, uh, who's a real pioneer in, in Southern scholarship, but also in, in using technology to do new things in history. And um, he had a project called the Valley of the Shadow Project that um, was about the American Civil War. After my first year at UVA, he, he came up to me and he said, um, he said, listen, we need some people to work on the project over the summer. Are you interested in doing digital history? I had no idea what that was. And I said, no, I do not want to do that. I want to do anything else. Um, he said, well, it, it pays $10 an hour. And I said, oh, well, then tell me more about this digital history you speak of. But it was a, one of those like serendipity kind of things that uh, is what makes life, I think, really interesting. You discover something you never expected. Because I got into the project and I realized that there were things we could do with technology and the digital medium that you just can't do in analog form, right? We could do history in new and exciting ways and we could reach big, broad audiences with the World Wide Web, which when I was doing this in the early 2000s was still kind of wild and wooly. Um, so I, I, I became convinced, and this is why I do it now, that there are things that you can do and therefore insights you can gain from using computer science techniques with historical information that are, makes it worth the time and the effort. It's not just pretty and interesting. It really provides, I think, new insights and way to examine information. So um, I was involved in a lot of early projects. Um, one of the most important ones for me is that as a graduate student, when I started working on what became Save the Empire, um, I started a project called uh, the Texas Slavery Project. And it was looking at the movement of slave holders and enslaved people into Texas during the Republic of Texas era. And I was doing that with this new digital mapping stuff that allowed me to see those patterns in ways that you could see them change over time. And it gave me some real insights that I wouldn't otherwise have that ended up in the book and ended up becoming very, very important and kind of launched me a little bit in my field as not just a Southern historian, but also a um, digital historian. What was it about that particular subject that made you say that this is what I want to study versus um, something like Revolutionary Wars or Thomas Jefferson or, you know, whatever it might be at Virginia or in Texas? No, oh, it's a great question. So I, I grew up in Houston and I remember taking fourth and seventh grade Texas history. I remember being bored out of my skull because it didn't seem to be connected to a broader issues in North American history. Everything about Texas seemed to be unique only to Texas. And it was really interesting because it didn't talk about big questions about slavery or freedom or 
citizenship, these big sort of things. So I want to study the South and I went to Virginia to study slavery because those seem like really big important things to me. And they didn't seem to be a part of Texas stuff. When I was growing up, um, slavery's role in the state wasn't really a, a big part of that conversation. It was just people would kind of look at it a little bit aside, but um, it was different in Virginia. Virginia couldn't hide from the centrality of slavery in the state's history. And so um, when I got out there, I was studying slavery and the movement of slaveholders. And I was, I was following these guys in the 18 teens and 1820s who were leaving Virginia and they were going down to Mississippi and Alabama and they're creating the cotton South, right? Um, but because I'd grown up in Texas, I knew that, wait a second, that's, that's almost exactly the same time Stephen F. Austin and the, the old 300 are coming into Texas. Are they, are they a part of this big migration that's going to Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama for cotton and using slavery as a result? And so that became kind of the epicenter of bringing me back to the question of Texas and, and, and trying to figure out what happens when people like Austin are trying to take a model from the United States of cotton and slavery, but then they put it in a whole different set of circumstances. They go to Mexico, you have to explain this to the Mexican government in ways that slaveholders in Mississippi who are planting cotton don't have to explain what they're doing to the United States government because it's 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 a part of what the United States is evolving into, and so it was an opportunity to kind of just see how all those different pieces fit together. And so, much like falling into digital history, I didn't really plan that. I just sort of walked my way in with curiosity, this direction, and that, and ended up ended up back in Texas with my research and the questions I was asking. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you mentioned uh, Stephen F. Austin. He's somebody who you've done extensive research on over the last several years. Um, and he's obviously one of the most influential Texans um, that there is. Uh, Greg Cantrell did an amazing uh, biography of him on uh, the Ambrosario of Texas book. And other than maybe Sam Houston, uh, Austin, I would say, is probably the most influential Texan of all time. What was it about him that made you decide to develop the Digital Austin Papers project uh, versus someone like Houston or going back to Virginia or somewhere else? Right. Um, so I'd agree Austin is enormously influential. Um, but the reason I think he's so influential in the 1820s and early 1830s and he's so effective as uh, an impresario, the land agent role that he played, is because he was really good at connecting people with other people. He was this person who was really good at, at building networks, um, which is something we think about in the 21st century, but the people did this in the 19th century as well, and Austin was a real master at that. He, he wrote letters to people throughout Mexico and the United States, and he became, during his time as an impresario in Texas, this sort of like, um, I would say, like almost central clearinghouse for how Americans think about Mexico and how Mexicans were thinking about Americans because anyone in the United States was interested in Mexico during this period they wrote letters to Austin and Austin often wrote letters to them and for Mexican officials whether they're in Mexico City or in the state government in Saltillo and Coahuila they also wrote letters to Austin going back and forth and he had all these very you know deep powerful relationships and friendships with these different groups so Austin um is a fascinating character all by himself and was very powerful in what he did. It was because he harnessed the power of his connections with all these other people. So I find Austin fascinating because he's a window into the broader world here. And it's not just the force of his personality that's really pushing things forward in Texas. It's his ability to connect people who are in different positions of power, to persuade people, especially through his writing. Like that's where Austin's charisma is. Like, like Stan Houston's charisma was his physical presence, and his ability to inspire in that way. For Austin, it was his writing and his ability to persuade in that way. The idea behind the Digital Austin Papers was to say, let's look at Texas in this crucial period, right? The 1820s and early 1830s, when Austin's here and he's writing so much. As a window, not just into Austin, although that's fascinating and important, but as a window into how Americans and Mexicans are thinking about each other, interacting with each other and talking to each other because his papers are not just his, they're also a bazillion other people um, who are involved in this interchange between Americans and ethnic Mexicans across this borderland region that I just think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, we've learned by studying uh, the Spanish collection here at the GLO is what a amazing record keeper Austin was. And I think that that might be one of the reasons that he was so influential was because he, he documented everything. He could always back up uh, 
what he was trying to do. And one of the reasons that historians have been able, uh, like yourself, have been able to capture onto is that his records and his papers are everywhere, it seems like, in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And there's not just one folder or one box, it's multiple volumes of material. And uh, he, he has left an imprint, which you've so uh, perfectly captured through the Digital Awesome papers. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the project uh, was put together? Uh, what were some of the resources that you needed? Uh, who did you work with? Uh, what were some of the challenges that you came uh, across on the project? And what was something that you learned about Austin that maybe you didn't know before uh, you started this project that you uh, learned about him afterwards? Yeah, so um, I, I came up with the idea of the project, I think, uh, when I was finishing up my, my, my PhD in Virginia, um, because I used Austin's work so much in writing the first draft of Seeds of Empire. And I knew how important he was. And, and I knew as well, like, this stuff was not as accessible as it needs to be because of what you're describing. It's, there's a, it's a lot of it's everywhere. Um, the main collection is at the University of Texas archives. And uh, a big portion of that was published in the 1920s um, by a historian at UT named Eugene Barker. So you can go get that original 1920s publication and find a lot of stuff. It, it makes it way more accessible than going to you know, the archives. But there was so much more than that. Um, and because of my digital mapping project work, what I wanted to do was not just make those, those letters accessible to anyone online and searchable, um, but I wanted to find new ways to put things together with those letters. Because in, in, when you write a book, what you do is you, you accumulate all these different primary sources, right? And then you, you figure out how they fit together. You figure out the story that they collectively tell and, and you figure out, as I always think of them as the networks that they represent. And you, you write that in a narrative sort of form. That's how you put it together, right? The, the, the narrative is the way you stitch the different pieces together. I wanted to provide something like that in the Digital Austin papers where you can take Austin's writings and you can read the individual letters. That's amazing, it's powerful. You can find a needle in a haystack um, or sometimes a haystack of needles depending on what you're looking for. Um, but what the project is meant to do as well is to give you new tools for stitching things together and seeing like, for example, we provide maps of where all the letters are coming from and where they're going to. Um, we provide um, you know, graphs and things about quantity over time, how positive and negative Austin's writings were at any given time. We're trying to find ways for people to stitch things together and find those sort of connections. Um, and so to do all of that, we needed a lot of help. <laughs> So you asked like, how did we put it together? And uh, the answer, as soon as you asked that, the first thing I thought is like, well, we're not actually done yet. Um, because uh, a digital project like this is never quite done. Um, and it's a long kind of endeavor. But where we started is that we took uh, the original writings that were published and we scanned those and we turned them into digital documents. And we built a database for that. And um, we reached out to partners like the General Land Office that holds a lot of Austin's um, archival materials, the University of Texas. Um, we, we got funding here at the University of North Texas internally. We got funding from um, the Summerlee uh, Foundation, which generously underwrote um, some of our very earliest work. I recruited some graduate students. And then I spent a lot of spare time, whatever little I had on nights and weekends, you know, cobbling stuff together. And so we had an ugly first version. We had a less ugly second version. Um, we had help from a group called uh, Brumfield Labs based in Austin that uh, has been very helpful in building uh, an ar architecture underneath the whole project that really makes it hum. Um, and so, you know, so the reality is it, it's, I, I'm, I'm only one of a lot of people that, that put together the project and were able to, to build on the whole thing. Um, and I love that because it's a collaborative process. It's never quite A, done, and it's B, it's never ever just my idea or anyone else's idea. It's this kind of ongoing back and forth between different people who've been a part of the project. So when people go online and take a look at it, um, what you're seeing is the culmination of you know, several years and a lot of people collaborating on how do we really examine Austin in these different kinds of ways. And, the thing that's kind of kept us together, I think, is that big vision of this man's correspondence is not just a window into him, but into North America. And if we can find new ways for people to put those pieces together, there are probably stories to tell 
and insights to be gleaned there that you couldn't get any other way. This last year, the land office acquired a atlas that belonged to, that was made by Zebulon Pike. And so I said, I wonder if Austin, if for whatever reason ever mentioned Zebulon Pike, which why would he? Uh, Pike was here 20 years before Austin came and he really wasn't here that long. But strangely enough, there was one letter where Austin refers to uh, Pike talking about Texas favorably and how he encouraged uh, people to come to, how Pike encouraged people to come to Texas, similar to what Austin was doing uh, two decades later. Uh, it really is amazing how much uh, can be found within the Digital Austin awesome papers uh, and how easy it is to find. And I think that's a testament to what you, uh, Ben Brumfeld, your interns, UNT and Summerlee uh, put together. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I, like, I like how you frame that because for me, that's what's the most exciting thing about doing a project like this is that, and I've always said this about my projects, um, it's like the most interesting interesting thing that will come out of this is something somebody else does with it, right? Like when I write a book, you know, it's, it's my interpretation. It's my finding the pieces that fit together. And it's me emphasizing the things I think are important versus the stuff I don't think is as important, right? All of that's there. All that deep richness is there. And there's a, a lot of people doing all kinds of amazing stuff. There are scholars. There are people who are just interested in these sort of topics. There's a lot of genealogists who will find family connections in ways they weren't expecting because they go to Google and they'll put stuff in and it'll show up either in the Austin papers or somewhere else, you know, um, with a mass digitization of historical resources. And you have all these connections that were already there, right? Those things exist. We just didn't discover them before because we couldn't shine a bright light on them. And, and now in the digital age, I think some of those artificial restrictions are coming off in a way that's, I, I find intoxicating and in how powerful that is for what history can do and what it can be and how it connects to people beyond what we do in the classroom here at someplace like UNT um, or sitting in, in the archives room um, in the GLO. Those things are wonderful, but if we can connect them even more broadly than that, I think we have the opportunity to do things we, we couldn't have imagined before. Well, and now uh, it's so much more of a useful tool because in a lot of cases uh, due to this uh, pandemic, you're not able to go to an archive or you're not able to do some of this research in person. And so I think uh, while this is a moment in time and we will be able to get back into archives and libraries again, the world of research doesn't stop because the rest of the world stops. People still need access to this stuff. Uh, from a land office perspective, the land surveyors, oil and gas people, they're who uses our records the most and they can't just stop working because they can't visit us. So by being able to access this material online, uh, they're able to keep their jobs going and keep the economy going. And conversely, if you've got students who are researching Austin and they're one semester, one, uh, semester away from finishing their dissertation, they can't just stop because they can't come to the, to the building. Yeah. And your tool provides that. Well, it does. And I get emails from people um, with all my projects, but the Austin Papers is a great example, you know, from all over the world. And it's, it's because they can access these things through the digital medium, and then it's getting incorporated into projects and works that may never have touched the story of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, what happened here. But because that artificial barrier is down, you know, somebody in Belgium, I got an email not long ago from somebody in Belgium, asking about the project and how they could cite it in their pro in their project um, can can engage that in a way that's really cool. The other side of this that is really exciting, I think, is that because these projects are online, I'll often also get emails from people who have their own documents in their attic, right, or something that that you know Grandpa had in the shed, and I, I was cleaning it out and like, wow, there's all these things from the 1830s in there, and so. It's really interesting by putting out a project like this um, you often get kind of this feedback loop of people who are not only interested in what you put up but have things of their own that no one knows about and may never have known about if they didn't try to figure out what it was and google things online and go oh i think this is a ledger from you know stephen f austin or samuel may williams or something like that and so we've been very fortuitous in the project and other projects i've done and being able to bring in new materials that otherwise we would never have even known about you mentioned that the project isn't done yet, but 
yeah. how, how, how will you know whenever the project is done? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. I mean, the thing about the digital, so a book is done when it's printed, right? Like there's an easy, like this is done. The digital, the thing that makes it a gorgeous thing is that it's alive and people can you know, tell you, hey, there's a mistake here. Hey, here's another document you can add. You can always do something with it. So you kind of have to decide where your goalposts are going to be. We haven't really decided yet. Um, my goal is to get everything up that we know about in some form or fashion. Austin was so involved in so many places that, you know, his material is kind of everywhere. I've, I've seen some of his material in Mexico when I've done research trips down there as well. So we're trying our best to aggregate all of that and kind of put it all into one kind of clearinghouse um, and make that um, accessible and, and long-term um, available. Uh, and not just as a record for Austin, but really as a place that sort of like get a, a, a deep sense of just where all these different little pieces might might be. Because unless you're somebody like Greg Cantrell and you write a biography of Austin or you do the papers that I've been doing, it's unlikely you're going to be able to spend the time it takes to really find where all these different disparate pieces have gone to. We've talked a little bit about uh, some of the interesting aspects of the project, some of the challenges that you had. Uh, and uh, things like that. What do you envision, or what would you like to have the impact of the Digital Austin Papers project to be? I will feel good about the project um, if we can aggregate almost all of Austin's materials and then turn it loose, right? So I've never built a project or written something hoping it has a particular impact that I want it, it to, to have, because you just don't know. Like you make something, you write something, you put something out, and then it has its own life outside of you. Again, I think that's what I'm most excited about, is that whatever really cool things come out of this beyond what I want will be things I've never thought of and never anticipated. I've talked to some folks who thought about doing similar sort of projects with other figures in Texas and North American history. I think that'd be fabulous. Um, but I kind of, what I want most for the Austin papers, I think, is a springboard for other people to say, that's cool, what if we did this too? Or what if we did this in a different context and be a springboard for, for innovation in that way? That's great. Um, so what are some other projects that you're working on right now that people might find interesting? Um, <laughs> find interesting. Um, so I'm doing two main things right now. Um, the, the one thing I'm doing is I'm writing a biography of 19th century Galveston. Um, which Galveston was, most people don't know it now, but Galveston went from being basically a sandbar island in 1836 to by the late 1890s, it was rivaling New York City in terms of influence in the United States. It was just a massive metropolis. It was the third richest city in the entire um, United States. Um, and then it gets wiped out by the hurricane in 1900. And, and we don't know that anymore. It's, it's been something that's gone away. But if you want to understand not just the development of Texas, but really the American Southwest, you have to understand the story of Galveston. So I've been working on that. Um, the other project, and this is one I'm really excited about, is uh, something we've launched here at UNT um, that is called uh, Texas History for Educators, or Texas History for Teachers, actually. And it is a project that is seeking to give as many resources to um, public school teachers in Texas to teach Texas history at the absolute razor's edge of what we know about the Texas past. And so we have a lot of video lectures of me talking about the Texas Revolution or the Republic and all the eras in Texas history. We have a lot of um, primary source documents that we've been curating from the portal of Texas history and lesson plans. And we're kind of trying to aggregate all of that together into something that ultimately will be, I hope, a kind of one-stop shop for a full Texas history curriculum that gives a sense of, you know, all the nuances and depth of the past that still meets all the teaks and the state standards that, that fourth and seventh grade teachers need to be on top of. It, is that project already available for teachers to find today or is it still still in the works? It's it's in early stages. We're building kind of the first the first unit of that around the Texas Revolution. And so we hope to, to be able to make some of that available as soon as we can. That'll be an exciting thing because Lord knows the teachers need as many resources as possible to uh, get, get the job done, especially right now. Uh, a lot of COVID shines a bright light on the need for, as you just said earlier, about resources that are always there and easily accessible for folks who need them in any circumstances. Yeah.
One thing that I like to ask all of our guests as kind of a way to wrap things up is uh, everybody can think of in their own personal history, uh, some type of historic item, whether it be a document, a map, a mm -hmm. painting, or some other type of object that uh, made a lasting impression on them. Mm -hmm. uh, as a historian, you've seen thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, examples in various archives and libraries. Can you think of one item in particular that uh, you can look to as making a lasting legacy on you personally? I can think of a couple, but I'll tell you my favorite um, is the Austin's Connected Map, which is at the GLO. Um, and for anyone who's never seen it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's something to behold. It is a massive map of Stephen F. Austin's colony that shows in exquisite detail where everybody had their land cordoned off and marked and all the roads and the beginnings of towns and networks and everything in Austin's colony. And I remember seeing it when I was working on Seeds of Empire. I was actually at the GLO doing research and um, we went back to the map room and I see what you, James, who actually showed it to me, but like there was this massive, I forget how you guys had it exactly. I think it was hanging or something like that. You pulled this whole massive thing out and it's just astounding in its size. But why it got me is that here was a visual representation of everything I was working on, right? Where everyone had moved to, what they were doing there, the complexity of the networks that Austin was engaging in, you know, in this physical size that was so overwhelming, it really gave a sense of the scale, the power of which all of these things are happening. Often you look at a letter and it's like tiny little thing and it had a big impact. But here was something that physically intimidated me, standing next to it, taking in the breadth of all of this. And it was this humbling kind of moment of realizing the, the, the scale of what Austin had done and what Austin represented and the change that was coming out of all of this that I was writing about and, and focusing on, it was so beautifully encapsulated in something that is not just a source from the era that's sort of a time machine that takes you there, but it, it was a, it was a, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's a beautiful piece of art also by itself. And so in Seeds of Empire, I have a very tiny little image of it a little detail that I put in, because I, I could not do that. It was just too beautiful not to. And so that is the one piece of historical evidence that I always think back that like really moved me when I'm seeing it in a way that I just, I was not expecting to be moved that way. And um, that, I'm glad that you said that and we did not pay you to, uh, to <laughs> no. one of our GLO <laughs> documents. Um, one of the things about that map is that it wasn't meant for publication. It wasn't meant uh, really to have much of a life beyond its original use, which was to show the land grants uh, that were titled within Austin's colony. And it's funny, uh, for as amazing as a map as it is, and for as old as the land office as it is, uh, dating back to 1837, uh, whenever the map was completed, it's never been published about. And you actually talked a little bit about it uh, whenever you were speaking at our symposium last year. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit more about that, if, if you don't mind? Well, what I got to talk about at the symposium was Austin's mapping and how he thought about the visual landscape and how important he was in, in doing what Pike did that you talked about earlier, which is spreading information about Texas. And how much he invested in, in producing this beautiful map, you know, from the early 1830s, became kind of a uh, genesis of how people understood the region. Um, and, and that his mapping was so deeply important. But the richest source of all of his information, as you said, is the connected map, which has never been published, wasn't published at his time. It was a record keeping tool, is what he was using it for. Um, and and it has been a record keeping tool for the general land office ever since then. Um, and it, it gives a sense, again, I think of that breadth and power of not just Austin, but all the people that are coming, because it's full of these names, right? Of all the different settlers and where they're going and who's got more land and who's got less land. You can see power dynamics embedded in it. You can see the effects of these people coming because of all the roads that are emerging as a result of their migration. and. And you can imagine how those things are like arteries in the region that continue to expand and grow over time. And it really captures the life and vibrancy of that age in a way that few maps really do. Maps tend to be very like placid, 
like just very information dumps. And this has a vitality to it because of what of the kind of information that it's capturing and the humanity of it that um, I think would be a, a great piece of, of scholarship for somebody to, to tackle and, and dive into. Because it's, it is a shame, as you're saying, that more people aren't aware of not just its, its scholarly value, but really the, the beauty of it, I think, as a historical document. So uh, with that, uh, we will uh, wrap things up. Uh, once again, we're with Andrew Torriott, who's the author of Seeds of Empire. Uh, he's also the lead on the Digital Austin Papers Project. Uh, Andrew, thank you for speaking with us today. I really appreciate your time. On behalf of Commissioner George P. Bush and the Texas General Land Office, thank you once again for joining us here. We'll be back next time with more This Week in Texas History.